What's happening, Polite Society? I hope you had a good week. Today, we're continuing our series on the women's movement, so let's delve in. Hello, everyone. If you're here for the very first time, welcome to my channel. I'm Alan. Let's take a brief look at the different spectrum of theological views which are out there. There are six primary viewpoints on this subject. Number one is the revolutionary or radical position. Virginia Mullencott, who is best known for her God of the Breasts interpretation of El Shaddai, could be considered a revolutionary feminist. Revolutionary feminists find the Christian tradition irredeemably patriarchal and oppressive, and they often look to other traditions or new theologies. Number two is the reformist position. In contrast to the revolutionaries, Reformists would say that they recognize the liabilities of the Christian tradition, but they seek to reformulate faith and practice. Elizabeth Fiorenza is an example of a reformist. Number three is the LGBTQ plus position. Theologically, plus advocates' views often overlap with the first two positions. But queer theology, and I'm not using that term as a pejorative, it's an actual scholarly term, but queer theology has its distinctives with its emphasis on gay, lesbian, bisexual, and trans issues. Number four is the egalitarian position. It's sometimes also called the evangelical position. Scholars like Craig Keener and Linda Belleville are advocates of this position. Egalitarians believe that men and women are equal. And they argue that the leadership roles in the church and society should be based upon a person's abilities and desires. So for example, if a gal is really knowledgeable about the Bible and she wants to become a pastor, she should be allowed to be one. Or if a woman is athletic and she wants to be a firefighter, then she should go for it. Egalitarians also tend to stress um, mutual submission in a marriage relationship rather than that the husband should have the leadership role in the marriage. Number five is the complementarian position. Complementarians likewise believe that men and women are equal, but they believe that the leadership roles in the church and the family should be based upon clearly God-defined and God-created gender roles. They restrict the office of pastor, elder, and overseer to qualified males only, and they believe that the husband is the head of the household and that the wife should submit to his leadership role. Complementarians can be further divided into two subgroups. There are broad complementarians, and there are narrow complementarians. John Piper is a broad complementarian. He does not believe that we should have female cops and female military personnel. Some consider Amy Byrd, a member of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and a popular writer, to be a narrow complementarian. Personally, I think she's much more of an egalitarian than a narrow complementarian but she obviously would not share Dr. Piper's views on lady cops and lady soldiers. Number six is the patriarchy or the gendered piety position. Patriarchy is the doctrine that men are made to rule on behalf of their father God. And this naturally begins in the houses and continues out into the larger houses of churches and nations. It is taught and held by Dominique Tennant and Michael Foster. And I'm gonna get a little apologetical here, but to be honest, patriarchy has been the position of the Christian church up until fairly recently. Gendered piety proponents like myself point out that when the Bible talks about gender distinctions, the biblical writers always speak in terms of hierarchy. Men and women have 100% equal worth in the eyes of God. Galatians 3.28, in Christ Jesus there is neither male nor female. But in Galatians 3, Paul is talking about salvation. Whenever the sacred writers discuss gender distinctions, they always talk about authority and submission and women as the weaker vessels. The biblical authors specifically frame gender relations within a hierarchical structure. And that hierarchical structure is grounded in Christ and his church. Right now, I'm going to go through some biblical passages really quick with you. In Genesis 1, God created male and female, and they were both very good. Maleness is very good, and femaleness is very good. Men image God 100% as male, and women image God 100% as female. But that does not mean that we image God in the exact same way. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul states, For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. Men and women were created differently both biologically and psychologically. 
The leadership roles in the family, in the church, and yes, human society, should be restricted to men only. This is where I depart ways with complementarians. Many complementarians are reluctant to state that male leadership extends to all aspects of society. Gendered piety proponents like myself are not. I've always been a comprehensive kind of guy, and I found the gendered piety position to be the most comprehensive among all the views that are out there on this subject. The foundation for the gendered piety position is in covenant. Dominique Tennant has said that covenant orders love or establishes the right order of the relationship. And this prevents it from becoming sentimental or confused. In a covenantal system, everyone shares a responsibility and an identity with a covenant head. Covenant begins with Adam, and we implicitly enter into that covenant when we are born. The family line is always traced through the male. God is referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not the God of Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel. When we come to the monarchy, the covenant leadership role is assumed by the kings. The messianic throne is called the Davidic throne. In the New Testament, all 12 apostles were men. In the Old Testament, the office of teacher was assumed by the priests. And there is not one single example of a female priest in all of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, teaching is assumed by pastors, elders, and overseers. And again, there isn't a single example of a female pastor, elder, or overseer in the New Testament. Even egalitarians recognize this. By the way, the terms pastor, elder, and overseer are often used interchangeably in the New Testament. In terms of scripture, in the positive, Paul restricts this office to qualified males only in 1 Timothy 3. And in the negative, he prohibits women from holding this office in both 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 11. In several texts, both Paul and Peter instruct wives to submit to their husbands. In Titus 2, Paul instructs the older women to encourage the younger women to be workers at home and to be subject to their husbands. And how can a woman submit to her husband at home and then turn around and be a pastor at a local church and stand behind a pulpit and assume a position of authority over her husband? It doesn't even make sense logically, leave alone biblically. If you want to check out my own position, you can go to itsgoodtobeaman.com. All right, guys, I think I'm going to wrap it up here. Ladies and gents, if you have your own thoughts, be sure to leave them in the comment section down below. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you like the content here, you can subscribe by clicking on the icon on the bottom right. Then you can hit the bell for notifications. I upload a new video every Wednesday and every Saturday. Have an awesome rest of your week. And for my brothers and sisters in the Lord, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all always. I will see you all in the next video. God's blessings on your week.